We are going to talk poetry today. Poetry is one of my favorite genres, and I hope that you'll have fun in the next few weeks doing some awesome poetry. So first of all, what is poetry? Well, poetry is a type of literature that expresses ideas, feelings, or tells a story in a specific form. Usually what's called using lines and stanzas. That's what makes it different than like, you know, stories you would see in books or um, different kinds of writing. Uh, poetry is more in stanzas and lines. It just looks different. So in poetry, there's a few words you should probably know when you're talking about poetry. There's what's called the poet and the speaker. Just an FYI, and I'm not going to quiz you on all this, but I do want to expose you to some of this. Um, the poet is the, po the author of the poem. That's who wrote the poem. The speaker is whoever is doing the talking within the poem itself. So for instance, you might have had uh, a man by the name of Robert Frost wrote the poem. He's the poet. But in the poem, there might be a young boy talking about his love for his dog. In that case, the, the speaker is the young boy. So just an FYI, I just want to introduce that to you. All right. So when it comes to poetry, poetry takes on certain forms. And there are words that we should know when we're talking about the forms of poetry. The form itself of poetry is how the words look on the page. So it can be the way the lines are arranged, how many lines, the groupings of the lines. That's all considered what's called the form of the poem. Line is exactly what it says. The lines in a poem are a group of words together in one line. For example, this poem, it has six lines. One, two, three, four, five, six. Stanzas are what are called groups of lines that are organized and arranged together. So this poem has two stanzas. Together, this is one big poem, but it has two stanzas. Okay? Onward. Now, within the idea of stanzas, there's different groups, numbers of stanzas. Um, for you math people, you'll like this. Um, the most common are what's called the couplet, and that's a poem with two line stanzas. So every line, there's like two lines, two lines, two lines, all the way down the poem. There's what's called a triplet, and that's where the stanzas are organized in three lines. So it's three lines, three lines, three lines, all the way down the poem. Quatrain, some of these should look familiar from when we did our word study. Um, quatrains have four lines, so the poem is arranged by every four lines is considered a stanza. And then there are other kinds of line groupings like you know quintet and on and on, but the next most common one is called the octave, and that has eight lines in their stanza. So it almost, look, it almost looks like a paragraph because there's eight lines, but it definitely doesn't read as a paragraph. Okay, so those are called, the, the groupings of lines are called stanzas. All right, now for some of the sound effect words we talk about when we talk about poetry. First word, rhythm. You guys know what rhythm is. It's the beat, right? When you say, oh, I like that rhythm, it's the beat. Well, in poetry, rhythm is very important. It's the beat that's created by the sounds of the words in the poem. Um, rhythms can be created by what are, what's called meter, which is timing, Rhyme, alliteration, and refrain. So how the words are organized is what gives the poem its rhythm. And every good poem has a, um, the, the structured poem has a rhythm. The, the, the poems that don't have a rhythm are called free verse. And those are great too. Those are beautiful as well. But most standard poems do have some kind of a rhythm to the wording. Okay. Meter, I just mentioned that before. A meter is a pattern of stressed and unstressed syllables. Meter occurs when the stressed and unstressed syllables of the words in a poem are arranged in a repeating pattern. In other words, meter is like the timing, and often the author will, will organize the words so that the timing is the same in every line, and it has a certain feel to it and a certain kind of a, a, a measured beat. And when poets write in meter, they count out the number of stressed or the strong syllables and unstressed, or what are called the weak syllables, for each line. Then They then repeat the pattern throughout the poem. So what gives a poem its, its um, rhythm is how the author organizes the meter of the words. Here's an example down here. I'd rather take a bath with a man-eating shark or wrestle a lion alone in the dark, eat spinach with liver, pet a porcupine, then tackle the homework my teacher assigns. 
So if you listen to that, it was kind of hard to read because it was so small. But if you listen to the rhythm of that poem, you can definitely feel that the way that the words are organized um, has a different, has a certain rhythm to the poem. And so practice saying that yourself too if you want again. But yeah, that's an example of meter. Free verse poetry is, is the complete opposite of metered poem. Um, in free verse poetry, unlike metered poetry, it doesn't have any repeating patterns or stressed or unstressed syllables. It really doesn't have rhyme. Um, free verse poetry is very conversational. It kind of sounds like the, the author or the poet is talking to you and they're just kind of like dreamily reflecting what they're thinking, but there's really no like rhyme or rhythm to it at all. It's a very, what's called free verse. Um, and the more modern types of poetry are, are what are called free verse. Rhyme, my absolute favorite. Rhymes right, are when words sound alike because they share the same ending vowel and consonant sounds. For example, lamp and stamp are words that rhyme because they have the exact ending pattern when, when you say them. They end and they have the same last vowel sound and they have the same uh, ending pattern. Um, they don't have to be spelled the same in order to be a, a rhyming word. They just have to sound exactly the same. Okay, here's a fun example. A poem is a little path that leads you through the trees. It takes you to the cliffs and shores, to anywhere you please. Follow it and trust your way with mind and heart as one. And when the journey's over, you'll feel you've just begun. So there's an example of um, poem rhyme, lines that rhyme. If you look at the lines, so first of all, there's two stanzas. I don't know if you caught that, two stanzas. And there are four lines each, so there are quatrains, right? Um, when you look at the rhyming pattern, it's path, and then trees, and then shores, and then please. So if you notice, the second and the fourth line rhyme, and that's what's called an ABCB, which we'll talk about in a minute. But um, not every word has a um, sentence has to rhyme. Sometimes every other sentence rhymes. Sometimes the first two rhyme with the second two, and that's all called the, the rhyming pattern, which we'll talk about next. Before I mention end rhyme. End rhyme is when a word at the end of the line rhymes with the word at the end of another line. They don't have to be together. They can be opposite, just oops, just like I said. Here's an example. Hector the collector collected bits of string, collected dolls with broken heads and rusty bells that wouldn't ring. So you can hear the meter. It's got that definite meter to it. But notice only string and ring rhyme. The other two don't have to. Okay, but that, that's an example of what's called an end rhyme. Internal rhyme, sometimes uh, poets put what's called an internal rhyme. That's when the rhyme is in the inside lines of, of the poem, not necessarily at the end. <clears throat> it's when the line rhymes with another word in the same line. Here's an example. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary. That's an example of what's called um, internal rhyme is from The Raven. I don't know if you ever read that creepy poem by Edgar Allan Poe. Super creepy. He just talks about, you know, this raven and how it's just watching him. And in his quote, it says, quote, the raven nevermore. And it keeps saying that at the end of all of his lines. Good idea of repetition. I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. But anyways, it's, um, it's a creepy poem. But weary and dreary rhyme, but... Here it's called internal because this is the first line and it's not at the end. Okay, so internal inside. Near rhyme is um, when the words are close to sounding the same, but they're not exactly the same. Um, either the words share the same vowel or consonant, but they don't, they don't have to have both. Here's an example. Rose and lose. They both kind of have the same sounding ending, but if you notice, the vowel sound is different. Rose and lose. But they're close in rhyme, and they look similar, so therefore it's called a near rhyme. A rhyme scheme is what we just talked about before. It's basically the patterning that an author decides to use to help the meter of the poem. Um, a rhyme scheme is a pattern of rhyme, usually at the end, but doesn't always have to be. Um, it uses the letters of the alphabet to represent sounds to be able to visually see the pattern. So in other words, right here, here's an example. Mary had a little lamb whose fleece was white as snow, and everywhere that Mary went, her lamb was sure to go. Now, if you look at this poem, this, first of all, it's a, it's a four-lined uh, stanza, so it's a quatrain, and we have uh, snow, so the first line ends with lamb, that's A, then we have snow, 
that's B, different sound, we gave it a different letter. Then we have went, different sound from the other two, that's C. And then the last one is go, and that rhymes, whoops, that rhymes with snow, so that's why it gets to have a B again. So the rhyming pattern of this poem is A, B, C, B. And that's just how you identify the rhyme pattern. But that's an example of what's called the rhyme scheme. Here's another one that's fun. I figured, oh, I figured with the coronavirus, you guys would like this one. Oopsie, sorry. All right, it's called The Germ by Ogden Nash. A mighty creature is the germ, though smaller than a pachyderm. His customary dwelling place is deep within the human race. His childish pride he often pleases by giving people strange diseases. Do you, my darling, feel infirm? You probably contain a germ. Infirm means to be sick. So here you have right here, here's the rhyming pattern. Here's an example of how every two lines rhyme with each other. So we have AA, because German pachyderm rhyme. BB, which is place and race. CC, which is pleases and diseases, and you go back to AA because infirm and germ rhyme with German pachyderm. So this rhyming pattern is an AA, B, B, C, C, A, A. Okay, and how many lines does it have? Eight, right? What do you think this stanzas, this um, stanz these stanzas are called? An octave. You're right, an octave. Okay, next one. Here, here I'm going to visit some ones we've already talked about a little bit. Alliteration, you probably would remember that from the la last week's lessons. Alliteration is when the consonant sounds repeat at the beginning of words. Um, example, if Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers, how many pickled peppers did Peter Piper pick? This is a great example of alliteration because all of these words begin with a P and that sound p -p 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 is going all the way through the poem. That is what's called alliteration. Consonants. Okay, here's a big word. Now you don't have to know these, but I have some of you that are pretty smart that are going to maybe want to be exposed to this. So that's why I'm throwing some of this out there. Consonants is when um, it's similar to alliteration, except the repeating consonant sounds can be anywhere in the words and in, in, the, in the words of the poem. Example: The autumn leaves hung silken, sad, uncertain, rustling. Kind of a sad, somber feel, and we have all this sounds going through this sentence. That is what's called a consonance. Consonance is when you are repeating a consonant sound. Remember that's every letter except A, E, I, O, and U. Remember we talked about that? Just the opposite of consonance is what's called assonance. It's when you repeat it, the, vo the vowel sound is in the liner lines of poetry. Here's an example like lake, fate, base, fade. All these words have different ending sounds but they all have the long A sound. Here's an example from a poem. Slow the mo I'm sorry, slow the low gradual moan came in the snowing. Kind of a oh all the way through there, because the, the John Mansfield, or sorry, John Massfield, um, took that sound and he ran it right through the whole sentence. That can be pretty cool when you're able to pull that off in a poem, but it takes a pretty good writer and with a lot of patience to build that. Repetition, another great technique when you start writing your poetry next week. You might want to incorporate this one. This is the intentional repeating of words and phrases of poetry. Um, it's never an accident. The author is purposely choosing to repeat words and phrases to make them stand out to the reader. So, for example, here's a short little poem. The best kinds of people are warm and kind. They are always there and they never mind. The best kind of people smile and embrace. They support you with strength and grace. So here's a quatrain because it has four stanzas, right? Um, but he, notice how the author um, repeats the best kind of people, the best kind of people. That is called repetition, and it's always on purpose that the author wants to do that because they're trying to really hammer home that idea of those are awesome people that do those kinds of things, okay? Lyric. You guys think about song lyrics, and you know I know you've heard that word before. Um, the reason we call them song lyrics is because a lyric itself is a short poem, usually written in first-person point of view, expresses an emotion or an idea, or describes a scene or an experience, somewhat like a brief story or experience the writer wants to share. Huh, kind of sounds like songs, right? <laughs> That's why we call them the lyrics of the songs. Here's an example. It was many, many years ago in a kingdom by the sea that a maiden there lived whom you may know by the name of Annabel Lee. 
and this maiden she lived with no other thought than to love and be loved by me. So it's kind of like telling this dreamy story that this person loves this maiden and he, you know, she's beautiful and he loves her or she loved whatever. And um, it's just telling the story. So that's what it called a lyric. And you could almost see this in a song. That's why we call them song lyrics because that's a lot of songs are lyrical. A refrain, that's like when we have songs and you know the part that always comes back when you're singing it. It's like the, remember when you guys looked at Roar by Katy Perry? And she comes back with I and I of the tiger fighter. That always comes back after her verses, right? Her lyrics. Um, that's called the refrain. It's like the most important part that the read the, the writer wants you to think about. Um, and remember that poem I told you about? The, it's called The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe. After every group of stanzas, he has quote the raven nevermore. Quote the raven nevermore. Every single end of the sentence that phrase comes. Um, it's very creepy because by the end, it, it was, it's, it's just a very dark poem. But anyways, that's an example of a refrain. It just re gets repeated over and over again. Symbolism, we talked a lot about symbolism, but within poetry, symbol symbolism is when a person, place, or thing, or event that has meaning in itself also represents or stands for something else. So in other words, if you want to think about something innocent in a poem instead of saying the word innocent you might want to say the lamb because usually lambs are considered to be very little you know, innocent helpless same with the eagle if you want to talk about power um you want to in, you know indicate something strong like you know for america the symbol is the eagle you would you could even say the eagle this the eagle that and it represents strength something strong is in the poem same with pe uh, symbolism and peace a lot of times if you use something you know, with a dove, uh, people represent that with peace. So um, you could also infuse some symbolism in your poems. And imagery, of course, imagery is, is poetry is, is nothing without good imagery. Imagery is language that appeals to the senses. And we did talk a lot about that when we were talking about your narratives back in October. Most images are visual, but they can also appeal to the sense of sound, taste, touch, and smell. Here are some great examples. You can read through these, but I'll just read a, oops, a, a few. He fumed and charged like an angry bull. No, right away, if someone's that mad, you can visualize how angry they are, almost like steam coming out of their ears. Angry, right? Um, the F-16 swooped down like an eagle after its prey. You can envision the, the F-16 making a nosedive and coming down toward the ground, um, just like an eagle would come down after something on the ground. So great imagery is um, very powerful in poetry, and you want to try to really create images in your reader's mind and engage their senses. And then here's some things that we've already learned about the last week or so, but I just want to touch on them again. So simile is a figure of speech which involves a direct comparison between two unlike things and usually uses like or as. Okay, for example, the lake is as smooth as glass. You're comparing the lake to a piece of glass and you're using like or as, so you know it's a simile. Opposite of that is metaphor. A metaphor is a figure of speech which involves comparing two things, but it doesn't use the words like or as. Rather, it says something is or things are something else. It's a very strong comparison without like or as. Example, the leaves are a blanket covering the ground. You're not saying the leaves are like a blanket. That would be simile. You're saying the leaves are a blanket. That's very direct. That's metaphor. When you, you say something is something else, completely more of a metaphor. Personification, one of my all-time favorites. It's a figure of speech which gives human qualities and abilities to non-human things. Um, here's just some examples. I'll grab a couple, but you're welcome to stop, pause this, and read them. Uh, lightning danced across the sky. Um, lightning can't dance like people can, but the way it moves can give the appearance like it's dancing. Um, Rita heard the last piece of pie calling her name. Pie doesn't really call your name, but you can pretend it does, right? All right, so personification is awesome. Alliteration we just talked about already. I won't review that, but again, that was something we talked about last week. Onomatopoeia, the formation of a word from a sound associated with what's name. Here's some great examples. It can also be animal sounds like moo or meow or woof. All those sounds um, are onomatopoeia because they sound exactly like they're spelled. 
Hyperbole, another great example of figurative language, that's when uh, things are exaggerated statements or figures of speech that are not meant to be taken literally. They're total exaggerations, but that's what makes them funny. Example, I'm so hungry I could eat a horse. Um, a human cannot possibly eat a horse. Remember we talked about this when we talked about hyper? It's above, way over the top comparison. It doesn't, it, there's no way it could be true. But it's funny to envision the guy sitting there trying to stuff a horse in his mouth, right? <laughs> Okay, and then there's idioms. Idiom is a word or phrase which means something different than the literal meaning. You need to read between the lines to figure out what, what this figure of speech is implying. Um, idioms are when something is said literally, but yet it really means something else. Here's a few examples. Um, for example, she goes the extra mile. Okay, that really doesn't mean she's literally going an extra mile. What that means is someone's going greater distances to do something to do it right they're going to go to greater lengths to get it done the right way okay so um these are just some other examples all of these have to do with working hard like um i am buckling down if you're going to buckle down and do your literacy work for example you're you're not literally buckling yourself down but you're it means you're going to sit down you're going to kind of plant yourself and you're going to sit there and work okay so that's those are called idioms i love idioms idioms are really fun all right, the, the next few slides I'm just going to show you, I just included all different kinds of poem, poetry types that you can stop and look at the video, pause it, look at these, study these. When it gets to next week and we're going to start writing some poetry, here are just some super fun kinds of poetry you can try writing. Some are easier than others. Oops. Some are easier than others. You just might want to do free verse. That's what's great. You might just want to do a free verse poem about how you're feeling about the coronavirus and how awful this was and how it, you know, not being able to go to school, but it's done for you or virtual learning. You can pick the topics, which is awesome. That's why we decided to do this the last unit, because um, I know some of you are definitely wanting to vent a little bit. Poetry is a great way to do that. But again, these are just some styles you can try, all, all sorts of really fun ones. Um, they're structured for the most part, but gosh, there's no, they're just ideas. If you want to just write your own stanzas, your own rhyming poems, go for it. Because this is meant to be just fun for you to, to, to take some of these um, poetic devices and give them a try. Okay. The last slide of, of the resource I gave you is just some extra little fun videos. If you want a little more reinforcement on like the difference between simile and metaphor, um, some people can kind of get those confused. Um, I don't know if you ever saw a simile, simile girl and metaphor man, but that's what this one is. I just like it. Um, <clears throat> but it really does hammer home the difference between the two of them. And then another one for personification, if you feel like you need a little more extra help with that. And then idioms is a real fun one if you want to take a look at some different idioms um, and again, just a little more instruction if you're feeling like, mm, I'm just not really sure I get idioms, click on some of these. They're only a couple minutes, like two minutes long, but it'll probably give you a really good, um, a good rundown of, of what, you know, idioms are all about. So there you go. I hope you had a good time learning about poetry. I know I threw a lot out there at you guys, um, but I just wanted to get it all out there because the rest of the week you can have time to think about it and then use any of it I gave you for next week when you write some poetry of your own. And I'll give you a guide sheet for that. There is a worksheet that goes along with this lesson. It's in Google Classroom. Um, just a chance for you to pick and choose and try a few different techniques that, that I showed you today. Uh, I kept it easy. Uh, I want you to have a good time. So I hope you had a fantastic time learning about idioms, you guys. I'm mean, learning about poetry, and um, I miss you guys. I hope you enjoyed just seeing my face and hearing my voice again. Um, I, I don't won't, won't have too many chances more to do this, so I wanted to make sure I had a time to do it. Uh, have a great rest of your day, and we'll talk to you soon.